they didn't have artificial light. Like they'd make things by candlelight or by, you know, light by a window or whatever, you know, with traditional tools right. and something about that's just very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, their, their working hours were different, you know, they were up and ready to work before daylight so that they could take advantage of those daylight working hours. And- listening to the muzzle loaders podcast the show where we talk about anything and everything black powder how's it going everyone you're listening to the muzzle loaders podcast and uh my name is darren i am your host and we are with jason gatliff today and if you're not familiar with jason uh he is the owner of the muzzle loader magazine and uh so if you guys are interested in muzzle loading i'm sure you're familiar uh even if you haven't read it i'm sure you're at least familiar with the muzzle loader magazine uh, it's a publication based on tr- on traditional muzzle loading, and it's full of history and uh, stories, firsthand accounts of people who are um, involved in the muzzle loader world. And uh, Jason is kind of at the forefront of all that. So, Jason, I really appreciate you joining us today, and I'm excited to dive into this stuff. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Um, so, just getting started. Uh, as it's my understanding that. Um, well, before actually, before we dive into too much of the history behind the Muzzleloader magazine, for those that perhaps aren't aware, what is the Muzzleloader magazine all about? What is it filled with, and what's the goal of it? So we are a, a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to traditional muzzleloading. We come out every two months, and we try to have a little bit of something for everyone that's interested in traditional muzzleloading, whether it's the shooting aspect, the hunting aspect, or living history and reenacting. Mm -hmm. So we have a mix of how-to articles, historical reference and research articles, hunting stories, um, trekking, period trekking, historical trekking stories, and some some stories about events, different events around the country. And then we also feature a different artisan profile in each issue. And typically every other month, every other issue, it'll be a gunsmith or an accoutrement maker, like someone that makes powder horns or does quill Mm -hmm. work or, knives or whatever and then we also have book and product reviews in the magazine got it okay so kind of just pretty much anything you can possibly imagine when it comes to traditional muzzle loading from rendezvous do you guys ever do anything with the uh, nssa we don't we never have okay yeah the NSSA. Uh, or, or at least it, i was going to say at least we have it as long as i've owned the magazine um the civil war kind of time period we pretty much stay away from there's other publications wholly dedicated to the civil war. Mm -hmm. So since we're the only publication pretty much dedicated to traditional muzzle loading only, we kind of stick to the rendezvous and before time period. So 1700 to 1840. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And that's kind of a, that's a time period that we've talked a lot about on the podcast with various different guests is being a particularly interesting aspect of history because you have people moving west you have a bunch of it just kind of inspires adventure you know and even Mm -hmm. just looking at the art on the magazine that you sent me it just kind of speaks adventure to me you know it's like you're out in the wilderness you are you know you have a muzzle loader and it's just a simpler time when you didn't have to worry about you know technology and all these other distractions and things right yeah and have you found uh that owning the muzzleloader magazine has that uh because i know that you have been involved in muzzleloading since before you owned the magazine um and oh yeah passionate well, about it has that uh how has owning the magazine affected your passion for muzzleloading it hasn't really changed anything i mean uh I, before muzzleloader i owned the magazine called on the trail it was dedicated to historical trekking mm-hmm. and so i did that for 13 years before i bought muzzleloader so i mean i've been publishing now for over 22 years Oh, okay. And so what is, uh, trekking? So trekking is basically trying to accomplish something with the technology of the period. So whether that's putting on your 18th century clothes and grabbing your reenacting gear and going out in the woods for a deer hunt or, um, survey or going fishing or, or just basically, you know, any of that, any activity where you're limiting yourself to only the gear of a certain time period. Interesting. So it's kind of like bushcraft, but you're limiting yourself to tools of the of a specific time period. Correct. Fascinating. That's super cool. Uh, is that publication still around? 
No, it's not. I combined it on the trail and muzzle loader into one when I bought muzzle loader. So everything that was published in, in on the trail would fit in muzzle loader, but not vice versa, because we had a lot more refined focus. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes so sense. I, awesome. Um, so I guess tell me a little bit about your past as well. So pre muzzle loader magazine, what were your interests in muzzle loading, and and how did that look for you? Well, I I went to my first rendezvous with at the age of 15. It was 1994. I was hooked pretty instantly. Uh, a year later, I had my own clothes, a gun, and a tent, and I started going to rendezvous and reenactments all over the Southeast. Um, and I mean, I still continue to, to do that. Uh, so I've kind of always been interested in it, at least since, since I was 15. Mm -hmm. And what, what, uh, what brought you to do that when you were 15? So my uncle and my dad had got a couple of muzzleloaders so that they could have a, they could hunt during muzzleloader season. They were big time hunters. That was pretty much the only thing we did growing up. Uh -huh. um, and a family friend, a longtime family friend went to rendezvous and shot competition with a, with a Hawk and rifle. So one Saturday in March in 95, my dad and I followed him to a rendezvous and spent the day. My dad didn't really care for it, but, like I said, I was just hooked instantly. It was shooting, camping, throwing knives and tomahawks, everything I wanted to do as a, as a young teenager. Yeah, seriously. It's, it's pretty nice. I really enjoy rendezvous and I haven't been able to go to very many this year. I went to a few last year, uh, but things have just kept coming up for this year and, you know, weddings and all that kind of stuff that seems to always get, mm -hmm. <laughs> get in the way of doing things like that. But, um, well, you know, and where y'all are, where y'all are located, there's not as many events going on as we have here at the East. I mean, you could pretty much do something every weekend of the year here. Oh, really? Interesting. See, I thought, yeah, we had... with it, I, I would say within a six hour drive, there's something going on to do with, with black powder every weekend of the year, just about really. Mm -hmm. Wow. I thought we had quite a few, we have probably a half dozen over here. And I thought that was a lot. I was like, man, that's a good amount of events, but man, every week of the year, you could do something that's, that's awesome. And there's a yeah. lot, there's a lot of history over on the East as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for instance, this upcoming weekend, uh, which will be the, the 12th, 13th and 14th, I believe there's two different rendezvous going on at this state here in Tennessee. One a couple of hours South of us and one over in East Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. It's, that's awesome. I know. Cause I know that, you know, like they said, the NSSA and the whole bunch of other things. I mean, there's so much history over there that, because I, I was born and raised on the west coast and so the history that we kind of that is more cultural over here is primarily um like oregon trail stuff the oregon trail passed through my town and all that kind of thing which is related to rendezvous and we have quite a few of them over here but as my buddy and i we traveled to the east this year and uh, spent a little bit of time over there and every place there's history i mean you drive past here mm -hmm. and there was a historical battle and then over there there was an old like camp and then over here you'd see a, a fort and it's just crazy how much of it there is over there compared to over here right and i think that's cool i think that um histo history is something that uh is really easily forgotten and especially in today's day and age people don't stop and hesitate long enough to remember things like that i agree and that's part of the reason why publishing the historical articles that we do is pretty important to me yeah absolutely and i think that the muzzleloader magazine is a really crucial piece of the historical <clears throat> preservation because you have muzzleloaders that there's a bunch of different camps of muzzleloading you have inline muzzleloaders and traditional and you have mm -hmm. people that are focused primarily on historical preservation and some that are a combination of all of them but uh, i think the historical preservation is one that's particularly interesting because uh you know you don't see so much of that in other industries but with when it comes to weapons and firearms and uh, people will like to think back to the history of it and bring it into the present mm -hmm. and preserve it and uh, i think that's crucial i think it's important to slow down because i don't think our bodies were really designed to live in the world that we're living in right now with technology all over the place and stuff it's nice to just slow down and take a break and, and remember the past sometimes mm -hmm. i agree and um, so with the Muzzleloader Magazine, what's the history of that? Because you aren't the founder. Uh, you did acquire it. And so what is the history of that magazine? So in 1974, Oren Skurlock out of Texarkana, Texas, and B.R. Hughes, they partnered together and they created Muzzleloader Magazine. The first issue was March, April of 1974. Uh, B.R. Hughes is pretty well known in the knife world. I think I can't remember what publications he's still involved with. Tactical knives or fighting knives, maybe. 
uh, but he's still pretty heavily involved in in the knife world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his wife is the editor for the American Bladesmithing Society's publication. But they they started the magazine together. At, within a couple of years, Oren had bought out B.R. Hughes' half, so he was the sole owner. He continued publishing Muzzleloader for several years. And then in the early 80s, his son, William Scurlock, went to work for him and ended up taking over the magazine. And him, he and his wife ran it for several years uh, until they actually came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in taking Muzzleloader over. They saw what I was doing with On the Trail at, after they'd been doing Muzzleloader for 30 years. They were ready to retire, move on to something different. Mm-hmm. So that was when I ended up buying it from them. Okay, yeah. And uh, how have you seen the success? Because a lot of people that I talk to in my family and everything, they, they you know, you hear that I work for muzzleloaders.com. They're like, you work with muzzleloaders? And they think about, you know, it's like, you know, who, who cares about muzzleloaders? Um, and I think that once you get involved in the community, you understand how, how awesome it is. And so how have you seen, like, the community grow and uh, support and come around Muzzleloader Magazine? You know, every everybody's so far has liked what I've done to the magazine. I don't really feel like I've made any changes. We're still publishing the same kind of articles that we were publishing in the nineties when I first subscribed. Um, the big changes I've made is I've added color mm-hmm. and my layout's a little bit different, but people seem to like it. I mean, we're, we're holding pretty steady with our subscription and our, uh, our circulation. Mm-hmm. People seem to love it. You know, every event I go to, the, the biggest complaint I hear is people say they miss on the trail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. You know, you're doing something right when uh, people say they miss your stuff when it's gone. So, <laughs> um, so with muzzleloader magazine, um, what has been the most memorable or most rewarding part about doing that magazine? Uh, you know, I, I enjoy it just about every aspect of it. To me, when I'm, when I'm working on an issue of the magazine, laying out the featured artist articles that we do, the gun maker and accoutrement maker that I was talking about earlier, those are the most fun. I'd say it's pretty rewarding that um, we won a Spur Award from the Western Writers, or from Western Writers of America mm-hmm. for Best Short Nonfiction. Uh, Ted Ballou's three-part series on the life of Daniel Boone uh, west of the Mississippi River. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was a pretty big deal. Uh, for instance, Lonesome Dove won a Spur Award and a lot of other very well-known uh, books and stories that I can't think of at the top of my head right now. <laughs> but but so that was a pretty big deal. I was pretty pleased to, to get that. Uh, some of the artwork we've been able to feature on the cover is pretty phenomenal, like the issue you're looking at. That's mm-hmm. a Mark Greeley painting. Uh, we've also featured Howard Turpin on the cover, who is probably the the biggest name in western art mm-hmm. i mean his his paintings at auction sell for over a million dollars yeah yeah I so think... we were able to feature no oh, go ahead uh, i was just gonna say we were able to feature one of his um there's there's lots of, of really rewarding aspects i guess you know another thing is just that people seem to enjoy reading the magazine Yeah, there's a real sense of community. Um, And I think that community is particularly strong in the traditional muzzleloading side of things because we we do a lot with both. And um, I've seen how inline muzzleloading often appeals to people who are primarily hunters and they're looking to Mm -hmm. have an efficient and effective season. Um, Whereas traditional Mm -hmm. muzzleloading, there is a serious community of and, and a bond shared by people that you know, go what if whether they hunt with it or go to rendezvous or competitions or whatever it is, there is a real sense of camaraderie around traditional muzzleloading. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, uh, the people are some of the best people you'll meet in the world. I love going to events and seeing friends and meeting, you know, new friends, talking to the people. Everyone, everyone is super nice. You know, I'm not, there'll be a few people that aren't, but by mm-hmm. and large, the people in this sport are just fantastic there's always a few bad apples I think in everything but I, right. I think when it, you if you're comparing muzzleloader communities to other types of communities the muzzleloader communities is much l- less toxic and everyone that I have encountered has been excellent to deal with and I'm sure that you can speak to this being in the industry yourself uh, everyone that I have dealt with in the muzzleloader industry has been remarkably 
you know, easy to deal with and down to earth. And they really just want to do the same thing that you want to do, which is go out and shoot muzzle loaders, you know? So, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. We, we're definitely, you know, we're not cutthroat. Everybody helps everybody out, uh, especially on the artisan side of it, which I'm pretty familiar with. I know, um, uh, knife makers are always helping each other with tips and tricks and gun makers. And it's just a super welcoming, very friendly group. Totally. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that that's, that's probably one of my favorite aspects of muzzleloading um, in that it, it's fun to shoot. Like, I enjoy guns and I enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy hunting. Um, but when it comes to muzzleloading specifically, it's the people that I enjoy the most, you know, about it. Yeah. So, yeah, I would agree with that. As, as much as I love to shoot and, and camp and hunt and uh, go to rendezvous, it's, it's the people that are my favorite part of the, the whole hobby. Totally, totally. Um, so what is your favorite muzzleloader of all time? A little bit of a change in, in pace here, but I have to, I always try to ask people we have on the show. You mean all, of all time or like contemporary or ones that I own? Uh, well, if you have different categories, then let's hear one for each. <laughs> okay. Okay. Of all time, that'd be a toughie. There's two guns that I really, really like that are tradi- that are period muzzleloaders. One is the brass barreled gun. Uh, it's a pretty famous original rifle. Um, I believe Wallace Gussler owns it, but it's just, it's a really cool, it's one of the earliest muzzle loaders with a, a metal patch box. It has a brass patch box, so it's just, it's just a very beautiful gun. And then the other one is the Casper Mansker rifle made by Thomas Simpson. Mm. Uh, Casper Mansker lived not too far from where I live, just outside of Nashville. He had a station about 30 minutes from here. Uh, years ago there used to be a lot of a lot of events and stuff at the recreation of Mansker station i used to be really active there so uh to be able to see and hold casper's original rifle it was made after the station this rifle was dated 1791 or 92 and the station was active in the late 70s early 1780s mm-hmm. uh, but still being able to hold the rifle that belonged to casper is pretty cool so i don't know it'd be a tie between those two guns uh, as far as contemporary guns, my probably my absolute favorite is one made by a friend of mine named Ian Pratt. He made it for Ken Gahagan, who's another gun builder. It's just a, a beautiful gun. It's got a brass finish. And what Ian does in his decoration and aging is just, it's phenomenal. He's taken contemporary muzzleloader building to a whole new level, I think. Mm-hmm. And then as, as far as the ones that I own, it's also going to be kind of a toss-up probably the lower gun here this Mm. is a 50 caliber flintlock that was made for me by mike miller another really really good friend of mine uh in 2006 so that's typically or has been typically the rifle that i shoot in competitions or hunt or the gun just above it also made for mike miller and this one was made for a good friend of mine when he retired from the post office this was his retirement gift to himself there you go and uh, it's a 54 caliber. Since I've gotten it, I've pretty much been shooting it in competition. So awesome. Those two are probably probably my my favorite that I own. And so you have a couple of of good friends that uh, make muzzle loaders, and um, and in conversations I've had with Ethan from I Love Muzzle Loading, we've talked a lot about the antiquing process and what goes into that, and how that process can take just as long or even longer than uh, a lot of the process of building the kit itself. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the real artistry comes in, you know? Yeah. I would say between the the carving, the engraving, and then, you know, how it's aged or antique. uh, Certainly. Of course, most of the guys I know are not building kits. They're starting from a a block of wood and making a gun totally from scratch. Totally. You know, both of those, yeah, both of those guns there were, were made from scratch. The bottom gun, uh, the only store-bought components on it are the lock, the triggers, and the barrel. Mike made everything else. He made all the pipes. He made the butt plate, trigger guard, the uh, nose cap that you can't see. But he made everything else by hand. I'm not sure about the second gun up, but the bottom gun, is, is other than the lock and the triggers and the barrel, is totally handmade. Wow, that's real skill. That's real skill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the barrel, yeah. what, what's the barrel from? It's a it's a rice barrel. It's a uh, okay. from rice muzzle loading barrels. It's uh, 
I think one of their Southern classics in 50 caliber. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, that's cool. I think that, um, the handmade, the handmade stuff is like a whole nother level and something that I'd really like to get into. Um, does he have like, Mm -hmm. does he have like a machine shop where he's able to like mill out like the, uh, the flash hole and all that kind of stuff in the barrel or does that come that way from rice? Uh, no, he just, I, I think he just drills it out by hand and then, um, I can't remember if that one's got a touch hole liner or not, but if so, he would just, just, uh, thread it by hand or tap mm-hmm. it by hand, you know, yeah. um, for the touch hole liner. But, um, no, I mean, he's mostly used and he does have a few tools like a band saw and a drill press and stuff like that. But most of his tools are hammer and chisels and gouges and stuff like that. The old school stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Made just about the way they were made in the 18th century with a few a few minor exceptions yeah yeah that's really cool i mean i always like to think about too like back in back in the day you know people made they didn't have artificial light like they'd make things by candlelight or by you know light by a window or whatever you know with traditional tools right. and something about that's just very cool yeah yeah well their, their working hours were different you know they were up and ready to work before daylight so that they could take advantage of those daylight working hours and in and, and bed sooner you know, we were talking about my history and I kind of gave a brief synopsis, but I'll, I'll kind of give a little bit more. As I said, we went to this rendezvous in 1995 and, and I was immediately hooked. And then uh, a year later, so 1996, I'm now 16 years old. I, I acquired a gun. It was a lineman grade plains rifle. Uh, in my opinion, the best factory made muzzle loader on the market. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a set of clothing and then a, a tent. And I started going to rendezvous all over the Southeast. Um, also in that same period, the same family friend that we followed to the rendezvous, his name is Buster Grubbs. He gave me a big stack or he didn't give me, he loaned me a big stack of, of muzzle loader magazine to read uh-huh. and reading the articles in there, especially Mark Baker's articles and Ted Franklin Blue's articles, uh, about period tracking and, and history and, and et cetera. I just, I really fell in love and it really lit the fire under me. So wanting to get started, I grew up outside of Macon, Georgia. So a few, we had a few rendezvous in the area, but or a few people that were into rendezvousing, but not really a lot going on, and, and definitely not a lot of people that were interested in period trekking or historical trekking. So mm-hmm. um, graduated high school in 97, started college in 99, I actually started a website called historicaltrekking.com. And we were one of the, the first forum sites dedicated to reenact and live in history out there, especially a standalone site. There were a few Yahoo groups and, and other things like that, email lists, but we were kind of the, one of the first standalone sites. Um, it got to be fairly popular. I think we were getting between 15 and 20,000 unique hits a day in the early 2000s. So that that's kind of what led me into buying On the Trail magazine. I didn't start that magazine either. Rick Edwards had actually started it at, 1994 um, I was a subscriber to that magazine I went to their website one day because I hadn't got an issue in a while just wanted to see what was going on and there was a, a letter from Rick saying he wanted to sell the magazine mm. and I had done a little bit of desktop publishing before serving as an editor for our blacksmith group newsletter and I thought I could do it and I ended up finding an investor uh, who lives out your way Kent Klein from Utah and he loaned me the money I bought on the trail magazine and, uh, everything went uphill or downhill from there. You know how you want to look at it. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. And so have you ever had a, um, sort of like a nine to five job or have you always kind of done the magazine and publications? Oh no, I've had several on the trail had a very, very small circulation, usually around 1200. And the most we ever got up to was about 1800. So it never never paid for itself. Sure. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, yeah, I, I pretty much worked a, a full-time job just about, or several the whole time that, uh, that I was publishing it. I worked for, uh, Virginia state parks for several years working at wilderness road state park in Southwestern Virginia as an interpreter at Martin station. Mm-hmm. So I got to dress in 18th century clothes five days a week and, and do all kinds of different things, blacksmithing and gardening and woodwork and all kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that, worked at a gun shop for a couple of years and 
and uh, worked at Lipscomb University as a, a public security and safety officer for a few years also. Oh, wow. So you kind of done it all. <laughs> uh, not a little bit. Of, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's the job of, uh, you know, dressing in 18th century clothes and, and showing people around sounds like a pretty epic one. It was, it was pretty fun. Uh, a lot of fun. A lot of, I had some really great years, learned a lot of things, uh, you know, thoroughly enjoyed it. We ended up leaving the job because we actually moved to, uh, to Nashville so that my wife could find better employment. The area around where the park was, there, there wasn't much going on. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, uh, you know, speaking of my wife, I, I want to throw this out there and, and talking about the people in the hobby, you know, I, this hobby is, is pretty much given me everything. I've met my best friends, through black powder and, and through muzzle loading and, and reenactments. And I even met my wife at a rendezvous. She was doing this before we met. And we've been married uh, almost 16 years now. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's where, you know, you find the good women because they're out there shooting guns and, and uh, not afraid to uh, get their hands dirty, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, she, she still, she goes to events. She's uh, pretty active at, uh, at Wilderness Road State Park, they have a, a few camps there a year, and she goes to them. And in fact, they even have an award there named after her. I believe it's the the Jana Gatliff Spirit of a Frontier Woman Award. Really? Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, I think she will actually be there this coming weekend for their event. I will be at home getting ready for the CLA show. Oh yeah. So do you get, do you attend as Muzzleloader Magazine or do you attend uh, there as like a, a content gatherer? Uh, both. We have tables set up selling the, the magazines. Uh, in addition to Muzzleloader, I also own American Pioneer Video. Mm -hmm. I've owned it for about five years now. So we'll, we'll have the, the magazine. We'll have books there that we publish and we'll have uh, all the videos from American Pioneer Video. And then also I will spend most of my time at the show actually getting working with Rick Lambert, our photographer to get uh, rifles and accoutrements and stuff made for our, our next year of artisan articles. Okay. So do you, I, I know you guys social media is awesome. Um, some of the best on all of Instagram. Uh, so who is running the social media? Is that your photographer or? No, that's actually Ethan Yazel. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Ethan, uh, I met Ethan several years ago and he just, he, has impressed me a lot mm -hmm. so uh i hired him to work for me just you know just part-time just to run our instagram uh i wish i could afford him full-time because he's just <laughs> very impressive young man yes uh but yeah he, he runs our instagram for me and I, I i'll add a picture to here or there but he handles most of it i say well i guess it, it makes sense why it's so good now because <laughs> if ethan's yeah. behind it <laughs> yeah. so yeah he does a great job yeah, with I, that stuff I am not good with social media. I like to, to scroll through Instagram or Facebook for about three minutes a day and I'm done. Yep. Yep. I'm kind of the same way. It's, it's kind of necessary with my job being the marketing coordinator. You got to do social media stuff and get through it. And, and I enjoy doing right. it to a point. Um, but really the podcast and getting to, you know, talk to people like you, that's kind of more my favorite part about the job and the part that right. I enjoy the most, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, and the the show is or the shows are fun too. I don't do you, do you go to Shot Show? I I haven't been to Shot Show since 2014. That's not as much. There's only a few vendors there that are really kind of fit our market, mm -hmm. so it's not really worth the time when I could just call them or email them. Um, but I, I do a lot of shows. I mean, I do a lot of indoor, either living history or, or long rifle shows, and then a, a few rendezvous. Got it. Yeah, it's throughout the year. It's a blast. I think that um, the shows are a lot of fun, the traveling, you know, getting to, you know, being in the outdoor industry is something that uh, a lot of people really want to be a part of. And it's kind of a, it's a huge blessing to be able to be a part of it, you know, and that you get to, mm -hmm. you get to go to work and there's some aspects of it that are work, but a lot of it is just having fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I enjoy going to the shows between talking to people at the show and, and visiting with, with friends that have tables set up and, and and then also, you know, what we do after the show is over, going out, hang out, eat friends or have a couple of drinks or, or whatever. Totally. Totally. Um, so back to the, uh, I kind of want to get your thoughts on the state of muzzleloading right now, because 
we have you you have your finger on the pulse of the muzzleloader world a lot more than most other people do being involved with the muzzleloader publication and going to all these different shows and and uh, having mm-hmm. all these different connections so uh what are what is one thing that you are super excited about and something you'd like to change and then what's your thoughts on just the overall state of muzzleloading at the at this current time you know i'll say the overall state of muzzleloading is it's in a great place it's changing from from what it was in the 90s or or earlier um but it's in a great place there's lots and lots of young people who are interested especially the artisan side of it and i think i think that's because they're they they have an appreciation for handmade items Mm -hmm. you know being surrounded by mass-produced things that that you know anybody can have it, it that are just fairly generic i think they have an appreciation for the, the smaller handmade cottage industry stuff that, that our field is uh, predominated by. Um, and then I think there's also you, like the TV show Forge and Fire. I think that's inspired a lot of people to, to try their hand at whether it's making knives or making muzzle loaders or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned the, the CLA show. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. It'll be um, August 19th and 20th. So a week and a half away, and there's a, a lot of younger people there that are there and, and they're making knives or making guns or, or powder horns or whatever. And that's super, super exciting. Uh, it seems like there's not as many rendezvous as there used to be, or at least there's not as many big ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, seems like those are, have gotten a little smaller. So I wish they would, I wish those would kind of come back. Uh, there's a lot of indoor shows and those seem to be doing really well. Um, but as a whole, and then, and, well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. What I see on social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are interested in our sport, you know, whether they're yeah. affiliated with us or, or they're a member of the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association or whatever, or the CLA, the Contemporary Long Rifle Association, um, there's just, there's thousands of people that are interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've seen on our end, we've seen how muzzle loading uh, since, you know, COVID was obviously horrible. Um, but I think through that, a lot of people kind of rediscovered outdoor hobbies and Mm -hmm. things to do with their time. And I think muzzle loading was not the least of those things. And we've seen how the community has grown a lot, how, uh, people are getting involved in it and you have more you know, like you said, more young people involved in muzzle loading now. And I think that really solidifies the longevity of it because, um, without having young people involved, it's eventually going to die out, you know, and right. really since the, since the seventies, we haven't had like a huge resurgence in it. Um, until very recently, I think where you have a lot of people that are really getting involved in the community and plugging themselves in. Yeah. Well, it, I, I agree, but I disagree. In, in the early nineties, you had a, you had last the Mohicans called a uh, caused a big resurgence in the hobby. Mm-hmm. So in the in the seventies, you had the Mountain Men and Jeremiah Johnson, and then you had the Bicentennial that brought a lot of people into the sport. And then it, again in the nineties, you had last the Mohicans. Since last of the Mohicans, there hasn't really been anything that's really drawn a lot of people in. Um, but other than that, I do agree with you. In Last of the Mohicans, I have not seen that movie. What is that movie about? You have never seen Last of the Mohicans? I have not seen The Last of the Mohicans. Oh, my gosh. So it was uh, based on a book written by uh, James Fenimore Cooper. Uh-huh. It's one of the, his leather stocking tales. It was a, a phenomenal book produced, or a phenomenal movie produced by Michael Mann. I think it came out in, it came out in 1992. Uh-huh. Yeah, we're, we're almost at the 30th anniversary of it. It stars Daniel Day-Lewis and Madeline Stowe and Wes Studi. Man, what? Yeah, I, I, I highly recommend checking it out. In fact, uh, the issue that I sent you, the July August issue, we've got the first uh, issue, the first uh, part of a two part series. Ted Franklin Blue is written about Last of the Mohicans. Fantastic. Well, it looks like I have my work cut out for me. I have to go home and watch Blast the Mohicans immediately. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you absolutely should. Um, a lot of the people that are that are in our hobby made were involved in uh, in the, the making of the movie whether they made props for the movie or whether they uh, were served as extras. In fact, uh, Mark A. Baker, one of our staff writers who, who no longer writes for us, but he was a staff writer in the, 
the late 80s throughout the 90s and early 2000s. He actually served as an advisor. He taught Daniel Day-Lewis how to load and shoot a flintlock rifle, how to load on the run, and he actually has a very, very small speaking role in the movie. So The Last of the Mohicans, I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is that? Is yeah, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I mean, it actually holds up. It's a really, really great movie. Yeah. Is it is it the best muzzleloader movie you think or frontier movie? Yeah, I would have to say so. Really? Yeah. And you're I not mean, it, you're not biased yeah. in that either. Well, no, I wasn't involved, so I don't have a dog in the fight. I was, <laughs> I was 14 years old when it came out. <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, The Patriot is really good. The Mountain Men are really good. Jeremiah Johnson, all great movies. But there's just something about Last of the Mohicans. It's just it's very very well done. Awesome. Well, I guess I'll have to check it out. Where where can I watch it? Is it on like Amazon or do I need to buy it? You'll probably have to buy it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if it's on Amazon or not. I know you can buy it on uh, on iTunes. On iTunes? Okay. Sounds mm-hmm. good. Well, then uh, there's got to be somewhere. It seems like there's like a thousand streaming platforms now. It seems like every movie is yeah. streamable. So. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. If you can find it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I always get frustrated. I, I want to watch a specific movie and can't find it on one of the services that I have. Oh, yeah. And then you have to pay. You get, like, this, the free membership, and you always forget to cancel it. And then <laughs> Right. <laughs> You're like, well, I may as well keep it because there's probably going to be some other movie I need to watch now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, man. Um, yeah, so I have uh, really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, obviously, you guys have an Instagram, correct? We do. Do you guys have Facebook uh, as well? At- we do. Yep. Just look up Muzzle Letter Magazine on either Facebook or Instagram. Awesome. And those are the only two ones we have. We don't have a Twitter or anything else. Okay. Yeah. Us too. Yeah. I think that uh, a lot of the other ones are, are, uh, you know, not worth the time. <laughs> um, right. So if somebody wants to get plugged in with the Muzzle Letter Magazine, if they want to subscribe, how do they go about doing that? The easiest thing to do is go on our website, muzzleloadermagazine.com, and from there you can buy a subscription. It's $32 for one year, $57 for two year for U.S. residents. And then we also have rates for Canada and other foreign countries. Uh, we're distributed internationally. Uh, or you can call us on the phone, 615-230-9853, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time, and order your subscription over the phone. Fantastic. Um, well, I highly recommend all you guys listening check out the muzzleloader magazine, uh, especially if you love history and love muzzleloading, that is something that you're going to, going to want to sink your teeth into. And so, uh, Jason, I really appreciate your time today and thanks for joining us on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thanks again for the invitation. Of course. Um, you guys listening, make sure to leave a comment, like, uh, subscribe, hit the bell to receive notifications. We usually post black powder videos about twice a week. Um, how to's reviews, all that kind of stuff to help you guys out. Um, if you have a show that you'd like us to do, make sure to let us know in the comments as well, because we really value your feedback. And, uh, also make sure if you're listening on the audio platforms, leave a review because that is going to help get our show into the hands of people that can benefit from the content. So, uh, thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk to you on the next episode.